preparation for the chess playing. And with that, I can assure you, the children will love this. For example, you know, if you put up uh, 10 chess sets, like we have done but in the back, soon you will all play some mini games, and you have 20 kids coming in, they run in, you know, to your classroom, and you say, let's play chess, set up the pieces, and start to play. They will, you know, they will just run to the chess set, start to play, and they will teach each others. You don't have to do much. What you can do, though, is to create a good situation, a good atmosphere. And that is what this is about, the playing method. Then after a while, what you also can do is what I call chess plus. It is uh, that you as a teacher, in the beginning, you're an organizer of the play, of the games, and so on. But in the next step, what you do is that you add some puzzles, some exercises that develops the kids. And then you have like a full system. That's the third step. And for example, in Sweden, when I work with the Swedish teachers, everyone uh, that comes to my courses, they are afraid. 25% of the teachers I've taught in Sweden, they don't know chess when they come to my courses. And my goal with the first course I give is to make them feel chess is so easy to teach. You know, this is not difficult. I can do it. That's with a feeling. The next course I have, the second course I have, is that I say, yes, it can be this easy, but if you do it like this, it's a little bit more difficult. I open some more, some more of the chess world. Yeah. And then you have the third, uh, syst the full system, with a chess curriculum, with um, a more like a training situation, then you open up the world to the teachers. But don't forget, children love to play. Never forget to have this as the basic. Already when I was a chess instructor, I always worked a lot with m m making the, the children be active themselves. A lot of chess trainers, they want to show how good they are on the chess, uh, you know, demo board. You should think like this, you should think like that. But we know that when, if you're going to learn something, you need to test yourself. Try out for yourself. That's very important. So never forget the importance of playing. Let them try for themselves. Do. What I normally do is that after the first round, when they play, I ask them who did win. They raise their hands and then they pair the winners. And then you have the losers, you pair them. That is how you can do it. Even though you should know, I never use this who did win and who did lose because it's not so funny for kids to raise their hands when they lose. So instead, normally I give new names. So the winners are, for example, Tom and the losers are Jerry. Tom and Jerry, you know these uh, cartoons. Or in Sweden, you should know the Star Wars trend is very strong. So normally the winners are Han Zolo and the losers are Darth Vader. And then it's a little bit more cool to be Darth Vader. So when I said, who became Darth Vader? Yeah, I became Darth Vader. Okay, that's good. You know, they are very happy to lose their games. So you can use this kind of very rapid pairing system very easily to make an even better situation for the children to play. Then another thing, uh, what you can do is to use this simple point different system. How many of you is doing that? For, because one problem when you teach chess and you let them play games is that, you know, for example, if we have a game situation, maybe you two play and, and you are very good in this scholar's mate. You can make checkmate in four moves. That means you will win in three seconds. But when you play, you do not really understand this with checkmate. That is difficult because what is happening, you are ready in three seconds and you can continue to play and play and play. How do you make a good rhythm? What I do is that I say that in six minutes, I will break all uh, games. We will calculate the points. If someone is five points ahead, they, they are the winners. That will give a good rhythm in the play. How many use this system? You do that system? Yes. I think this is great. We, all, we use that even in a lot of child tournaments in Sweden. We use this for the beginners because that gives a very good rhythm for the game. And as a teacher, 
you can always, let's say you have 25 minutes left of a lesson, you can calculate, okay, let's play three seven minute games. I will have three rounds that would be perfect to the end of the lesson. So that's a good way of doing it. So if you have a game-based learning, that means that you always let the children play as much as possible. One good thing is that ideas can be spread within the group. Children can learn from each other. What you do is, as a teacher, is that you can find a teachable moment. What I always do is, when I see the children play, I, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm quite a good chess player, so what I can do is that I remember the positions, you know, for example. So after the game I can say, hey, take a look at this position. Can you find a better way to continue here because you had a great chance? And that's a good teachable moment, mo moment after the game. And what happens then is that the teacher becomes more as a facilitator than a teacher. It's a coach that you help them to develop in teachable situations. One other thing that I think is important when you teach chess is to find a good way to structure the chess classroom. What I always have when I start a lesson is to have a game-free area. What do I mean with that? You know, one problem, I said that there were maybe 20 children coming into this room, go to the chess sets downstairs, down the, over there. What will happen is that the children will start to play immediately if they can. Then they will not listen to you because it's so much more fun to play the game. So I always start in like you do now where there is no chess sets. I'm sure if we had put up chess sets, you, could, you will start to play games because it's so fun with chess. You know? So I always start with this. It could also be a circle of chairs. We start with putting our chairs in a circle. And then we can discuss, this is the theme of today. This is what we will discuss with what we will do. And then you have the playing area where you play the games. And one very good thing with this is also that in the game-free area here, there you can have extra exercises. Because even you could make checkmate in only four moves, scholars mate, you have to wait for them. And after, when you have made checkmate, you will raise your hand and say, what shall I do now? As a teacher, you have to do something then. You could say, okay, you can play an extra game while you wait. But you could also say, in the game-free area, oh, sorry, in the game-free area, here I have some extra exercises where you can go to and where you can do some extra exercises while you wait. Then I have a demonstration board. Of course, this is a demonstration board. It is behind here, you know, this type of. This is the demonstration board. And then you have also the whiteboard over here. This is the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. I, when, I, when I teach chess, I always use this kind of whiteboard. Why do I do that? Yes, because I always work with guidelines. I don't know if you do that, but you know, chess is so rich. There is no so many possibilities. And I need to help the children to think. We, you say in English, rule of thumbs, what to think about, to sh help them to think right. For example, the first thing I teach children is the most important chess rule, the best trick in the world, and that is grab free material. That means every time it's your move, what pieces can I grab from the opponent? And is it free to grab anything? That's normally the best move. So sometimes, you know, when I see my children play games, you could see they sit like this. Grab free material. Grab free material. Ah, I can grab some free material. You, you know, they start to think about what is important. And also when I, they become better and better, you can have more rules to help them how to think in the right way. So this is what I write normally on this um, whiteboard, is this kind of, of rule of thumbs. So, I think it's quite important to think about this before you start a lesson, how to plan your chess room. This is, I think, a, a chess room in Armenia. It's very dedicated, they have everything you need, and they even have like special boards with this. Then here you have more the Swedish model. I think this is a Swedish classroom, a, a bit more chaotic with the chess sets on, on the tables like this. Then you could have this like this. It's a private school in England. It could look like this. 
or it's what is coming more and more using the laptop, you know, to play and train chess through the laptop, but it might look like this. Or it could look like this. This is a game-free area. This is from Judith Polgars. Um, you know, she had a chess palace, and they have created a perfect game-free area. You can see even the chairs here is, to, is uh, designed to get the best way to sit, you know, when you sit on the chairs. Here you have uh, on the shelves all kind of intellectual games to train your brain if you want to do something else than chess. Here you have a chess castle where you can be, have a masquerade, you can be the king, you can be the bishop and everything, you can have different theater with this castle in, in the background. So it's quite a great place, um, I must say. Demonstration board can look like this. This is the analog version. And of course, you can have it on your screen or on uh, the smart board projector. So what does a typical lesson look like? First of all, I always start and close the lesson in the game-free area. I, need, I think that children need a good routine for a lesson. And, and if you start in the game-free area, they will listen to you. I tell them what we're going to do during the lesson. I tell them what maybe I check if they have done, if they have any homework or done something like that. It's a good way to do it in the game-free area because then they will listen to you. If you do not have the possibility to have a game-free area, of course you can wait with giving them the chessboard chess sets. They sit in uh, the benches and you wait with putting out the, the chess sets until you have finished with the start. Then in the end, three minutes or five minutes before the lesson stop, you stop playing, put down the pieces, and then they have to listen to you before you stop. This is also something I think is important because then you have a good finish of your lesson. After the start, then I normally have uh, instruction at the demonstration board. Then they solve some exercises <coughs> on the theme and then they play games. That is the normal setup for a chess lesson, I think. So, what kind of learning materials do you need when you teach chess? Of course, you need chess board and pieces, a demonstration board, handouts or pupil workbooks normally. What extras? Instruction videos could be used, chess clocks and of course other technology. This is the basics. Now to the very first lesson. And uh, actually what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how when I meet chess, uh, a chess class for the very first time. So you are going to be my children. Now I hope that's okay for you. Uh, what we do in Sweden for example we have a, a tournament called Schackfyran Chess 4. And we do uh, like this, that we go out with instructors and teach children to play chess in only one hour. And this is more or less a little bit like we do it. First of all, what I do when I come in, I say, Hello children. What do you Hello. say? Oh, very good. I need this. Okay. <laughs> Hello children. Hello. 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 Okay. Today, I'm going to learn you how to play chess. Wow. Okay. Yes, that's good. Very good. I like this one. That's very good. Do you know that chess is a very old game? No way. It's true. Do you know how old it is? Five years old. Five? What did you say? Five years old. Five years old. Actually, a lot of kids say 50 years old. And I get a little bit, because I'm almost 50 years old myself, so I, no, no, a little bit older, and then I maybe say, I say 3,000 or whatever, but you are the of the game. <laughs> it could be, could, yeah, it could be, it could be. But what do you say, you know, I guess you know that, when, when is chess invented? Do you know that? When, what do they say? Sorry? Around, I know, 1,000, 1,000 years ago. 1,000, 2,000? 2,000. 12 and a half. Well, normally they say that chess was in invented in the 7th century, 7th century, 6th uh, century, that's, that's what they, you know, it's, it's a little bit different, you, you, could you, can, you can say different, uh, but, but normally what they say. And where do you think chess comes from? 
From Greece, they say, from Sweden, I say, well, yeah. Iran. It's correct. Normally, I can, I can tell you children, when I go to children, normally they say China or US, because everything comes from these countries. But I say, no, 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 no. Actually, they say chess comes from India. Yes, they say. Okay. But I can tell you, if I... Okay. I, I, this is the story I have, I've learned. It's that chess is from India, and at this time, it was called, um, you know, in, um, it was called, uh, no, not shatranj, could, you could say, but, um, uh, so, so uh, and it means uh, the, um, the four parts of an army. Okay. Because it was invented to teach the generals how to, uh, how to make a good battle. Because you, because you know that this chess, chess board here, the chess board here, this is actually a battlefield. In one, one side we have the white army, here you have the black army, and then they have to fight. And so he was the strongest. So this is a battlefield, this is the black army, the white army, and the goal is to train the generals how to put the pieces in the best way. After about 100 years, chess comes to Persia. And this is the place where it gets its name. So sometimes I can tell you also when I go out to classes to children and so on, and children are very upset because if they are from Iran or Iraq, they're very upset when I say that chess comes from India because they know that chess is from Persia or from Greece or from wherever, you know, they're very angry with me when I say that chess is from India. Then I have to modify my story a little bit, you know, but normally this is how it's said. It comes with a caravan of businessmen that comes to Persia. Chess comes uh, to this car. And this is the place where chess got its name because you know, uh, in, in uh, Persian language, uh, you know, they have the king is called the Shah. And you can almost hear Shah and Shah, for example, in German, or chess and Shah, it's very close. So actually, the game that we played is actually the game king. So I now ask the children, why do you think that chess, our game, is called the king. Why do you think that? Well, it's because, here you can see the Persian, the king, Shah, and checkmate, of course, the king is helpless. So, the king, it's because the king is the most valuable piece. It's all about the king. The strange thing in chess, you know, it is that uh, the king is also the slowest piece. It can only move one square at a time. And then I show, of course, how the king moves. You all know this. It only moves one square at a time. Then we have the most important piece. Uh, if chess was the, uh, if the king was the most valuable, then it comes now to the best piece, and that is the queen. And the fantastic thing with the queen is that it moves in any direction. Just like this, you can see here, it's a fantastic piece. And when I work with kids, normally, I work, I show with my hands like this, how the pieces move. I don't know if you usually do it, but they can, you know, you, you, you do the same. Yes, because I think it's very, you know, they scream to you, you know, how was the bishop? You can just show them like this, or the rook, like this, or the queen, you know, you can do like this. It's a great way to show how the pieces move. Okay, and probably you know this story about the queen, that when chess was invented, they, there was no queen at all. But then after a while, the queen came into the game, then it could only go one square on the diagonal, so it was very, very bad. But when chess became popular in Europe, we had some very strong queens. For example, we have, uh, uh, in Castilian, we had one queen, we had Katarina of, of Russia, and, and so on, Some, and Elizabeth of England. They could see that they played chess inside their courts, and they get very upset when they realized that the queen was so bad. So they forbid the game. They said, okay, the king is, 
what it's all about. But if you want to continue to play chess, the queen must be the best one. And they made a change. So from that moment, the queen was the best piece in chess. And actually, this is a true story. I have read a long, um, a, a long uh, book about this, a big book about this, how the queen became the best uh, piece in chess. And it was because of these strong women that we have, the queens. Then we come uh, to uh, uh, the rook. This is the rook, it moves like this. You all know this, so I move quite quickly through this. The bishop. And then you have the knight, of course, and you all know that the knight is the piece that is not uh, walking, but actually jumping. Can you show so, the knight with the hands? Sorry, do you want to show <laughs> the knight with the hands? One, two, no, three. With one, my two, hands, three. with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I try to avoid this one, but I agree, that's a good one. Now, it's actually quite interesting because some of us have started to say that the knight is always jumping over a ditch. I don't know what you do, but I normally say that chess, the, the knight goes like an L, the letter L. I think that's very effective. But some say now that also that it change color every time when it jumps. So it jumps over a ditch, but it changes the color of the square where it goes to. That's also a possibility. You can choose yourself. And in this position, I normally I tell them that in chess you can take the opponent's pieces, but not your own. And that means that the bishop and the rook cannot move in these directions, but the knight can jump over. And that's why it can reach this square, even though the white rook is here and the bishop is here. So, okay. Now we come to the pawns, and uh, when it comes to the pawns, I actually normally I tell the children a little story. And it's, uh, you probably know about the Romans, they were a fantastic, they had a fantastic army in uh, the be beginning of, uh, of the year 100 and uh, 200, they had a fantastic army conquering the whole world. In the front of this army, they have the most fantastic warriors. And these warriors, they had big shields like this, and they had like, you know, this kind of stick. What do you, what do you call that in English? What is it? Spear, it's, they had this spear, yeah, that's correct. It's, they had the spear and uh, they, to defend themselves. And these uh, shields, they were so big like this and very, very heavy, so they could only move forward. Could not go to the side like this, not go backwards because they were so heavy, this, this shield. The first time when a pawn moves, it's very fresh. Then it can move two times because it's fresh. Then this shield is too heavy. It can only move one at a time. And of course, in the first move, it can only, also move only one time. But then it's, again, it's too tired to move more than one step at a time. So, OK, if you come here, please. Here we have a white, uh, we have a white uh, pawn like this, and here we ha have our big uh, shields like this. And now you can see it's so big, so we cannot do anything. We just we, do it from the side. we fight, yeah. But it's no, you're not allowed. You cannot do that, you know. I know. But if you come here, please, we have a grey pawn here beside his friend like this, <coughs> and you have a shield like this. And now you can see here, you can fight like this. Thank you very much. So what does that mean? You know this, that means that here, two pawns can do nothing, but when you came up here, then you can take, like this. So that means that the pawn moves forward, but takes straight ahead of itself. So a pawn can move one or two times in the first move, then after that, one move at a time, and it captures diagonally, like this, and here you can see the shields like this. So, and it takes like this, and that is normally how I start. And now, as you can see, this took about 10 to 15 minutes. Now it's already time to play. And that's what I want you to do now. So now I want you to sit down here, because what we're going to do is to start with a game with only the pawns. And it's called crossover. I don't know if you have played this, but this is what we're going to do. 
So if you sit down uh, at the chess set, it's now to play with all the pieces at one time, direct is very difficult for a child, but they still want to play. So by taking it step by step, introducing one piece at a time is a very effective way to keep them interested in playing and to learn more. And the first thing I start with, like you can see, after only 10 minutes, is this game. It's cross the board. Always, uh, you know, you have white on the second row and black on the seventh. White always start in chess. Each pawn can move one or two uh, in the beginning, then one at a time. They cannot take each other when it's like this. They always take uh, like this diagonally, one step like this, you know this. White wins if a pawn reaches the other side. One single pawn should reach this one. And this one, one of the black pawns can reach this one. I believe that mini games is fantastic because also when you have a group of children, you know that some are very quick, they are very fast in learning, they are on this level, some are beginners. And then it's very difficult to find a good method to keep the interest of everyone. But these kind of games, children can play on their own level. I mean, I even, when I was training Magnus Carlsen when he was a child, I, I trained him for three years, and even he loved this type of games, because it's also developing for very strong players, this kind of. I played this also with the national team of Sweden, and it's quite interesting to see them play these games, because they are calculating so far ahead. The beginner will always be, can I take this pawn, can I do like that? A good player can calculate in advance who will win. That's why I think this is so good. Before we start, I want to also to tell you what I think is very important. Uh, yes, what I do is also now we're going to play a tournament. And this actually, I think, is a fantastic tool for teachers. Because uh, if you, you see this kind of, of a tournament uh, schedule, what you do is that you write down the names of the players in your group. I don't know if you use this normally when you teach chess, but I think this is very good, not the least for teachers, because also children can themselves fill in the formula. So it's a very easy way to arrange a tournament. You write down the names of the players. In the first round, you can see who you play with. And who is white and who is black depends on the color of your square, little square. You write down the results afterwards, and then you can have in the total, and you have who is now one, two, three, four. You know. So if you please start with writing down the names of the four in your little group here. I will give you points. I tell the children that this is how we are against each other when you play chess. And it's the code of behavior. Actually, uh, in Sweden, most of the schools have written it out and put it on the wall in the room where you have chess, in your chess room. The first rule is that when you play a game, I say we want to have this room of concentration. And then it's time to speak with small letters. It doesn't need to be completely silent, like we said before, but I, then I want it to be more like a room of concentration. And I can tell you, a lot of teachers love this a lot, that this is a, a clear moment where it's a way of gathering the group with this rule. Then, another thing that is, I think is very important, as you know also for chess tournament, is that everyone starts at the same time. I never allow them to start to play before everyone else is ready, because then it becomes chaotic. Someone will have dropped a piece, someone will have finished the games, there will be chaotic situation. So what I do, I wait for everyone, everyone is ready, clear signal, and they can start. From the very beginning, I say this is how you do it. Then we have this rule in, in, in chess that you show each other respect. And I think that's fantastic for chess, actually, that before the game, you always say hello to your opponent. And after the game, you thank them for the game. And you can, I, for example, me, when I was a child, I was always crying when I was losing a game, but still I had to say, thank you. You know, you know it's <laughs> good training for a child, this, you know, even though you lose, you behave, and if you win, you do it with grace, you know. Then I also do, uh, from the very first lesson, I tell them that if you touch a piece, 
you have to move it. Be and also, you know, if you dropped it, you have completed your moves, it's the opponent's turn to play. Because if you do this, my experience is, then there is not so much to argue about. It makes a good situation for playing chess. In the end, and I think this is a very important rule, when you have finished a chess game, you must put up the chess pieces in the beginner, beginning situation. Because you know, as chess trainers and chess teachers, there is nothing worse than having a chaotic situation. What, there is a piece missing here, some piece missing there, you know, it's chaotic. This, the, these are the six golden rules, I called it in Sweden. Everyone must follow this from the very first lesson. And I think that is great. So, okay, now time for cross the board. Have you written down the names and you are in the right position? Should you write down them? No, no, no. This is one group. Okay, this is one group. Okay, you are two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't match. It doesn't matter. Now you can add in the king like this. Please, uh, you put in the king on e1 and e8, bringing a pawn to the other side, bringing the king to the other side, or if you, your king becomes taken, you lose. So it's, you learn how, to, how this king should be protected and not be put in. Pawn. 